that annual free cash flow number that you mentioned of almost $600 million US per year for 29 years. I think that crystallizes it almost a little bit better to see, you know, that this is the type and scale of asset that moves the needle uh, for the largest mining companies in the world. This would fit very well into the portfolios of, of the largest miners out there. The Financial Survival Network. Now more than ever. The Financial Survival Network. And welcome. This is Financial Survival Network. I'm your host, Kerry Lutz. And hey, many of you out there have sent me emails. I've seen it in the chat rooms. You wanted to get an update on FPX Nickel, which uh, the CEO, uh, Martin Turan, long-term sponsor of the show. Martin, great to have you back on. Uh, things are happening. I saw that the PFS, uh, the preliminary feasibility study, just got uh, filed last week, and it looks pretty encouraging there. Yeah, thanks for having us back on there, Kerry. And yeah, it's been an exciting time for the company, uh, particularly in terms of our uh, completion of that PFS, as you mentioned, it really represents the culmination of a long uh, body of work over the last couple of years, um, subsequent to the uh, preliminary economic assessment we, that we did in late 2020. Um, yeah, and happy to delve deeper into the, what that PFS showed and what the road ahead is for FPX. Well, I always like to look at the uh, bottom first, the bottom line, the IRR, and uh, I think uh, if memory serves me correct, it was uh, almost 19%. Yeah, that's right. So at a, at a long-term nickel price assumption of about $8.75 a pound, uh, yeah, we do generate uh, post-tax or after-tax numbers uh, from an NPV uh, standpoint in excess of $2 billion US and an IRR well over 18 percent um you know that irr figure is very robust you know a project of this scale and scope one that can be producing nickel for almost 30 years um that is an incredibly strong irr and you know one of the other metrics that we like to look at is that uh the the ratio of the uh of the uh of the my life to the payback that's really something that captures and highlights the uh, positive attributes of having a multi-cycle asset. So in our case, that uh, my life is around 29 years, the payback's about 3.7 years. So that ratio of my life to payback is almost eight to one. And you'll see there's a good slide in our corporate presentation that shows that that's, that's really peer leading. Um, that That's the highest such ratio of any of the major nickel projects out there. And I think it speaks to that multi-cyclical exposure uh to the nickel price and to the nickel market that this uh, that our baptiste project offers it's interesting you know looking at the cash flow numbers you're estimating annual uh, you know pre-tax cash flow 578 million us dollars which uh you know on a on a capex which you're estimating at, at roughly 2.2 billion uh, that's a pretty good return and, and that only gets better because Right. Let's face it. The market doesn't give you any credit for production past ten years, generally, uh, in these uh, resource plays. So the upside here is, is, in my view, kind of uh, understated, shall we say? Yeah, for sure. the The effects of discount rates and of discounting of future cash flows, as you mentioned, does sort of unnecessarily or unduly punish these long life projects. And so those NPV and and IRR numbers, while they are very impressive for our project. I agree with you. They're almost understate the, kind of the economic value that can be derived here. And that annual free cash flow number that you mentioned of almost $600 million US per year for 29 years, I think that crystallizes it almost a little bit better to see, you know, that this is the type and scale of asset that moves the needle uh, for the largest mining companies in the world. This would fit very well into the portfolios of, of the largest miners out there. Right. So, yeah. And and looking at, at these numbers, you know, obviously, you know, the mine life is also understated as well. So, and uh, your capex, pretty much, uh, from what you're saying, is under four years. Basically, is the payback period. So it produces at least 25 years or 24 years over and above uh, its payoff period with a minimal capital. Um, expenditure, it really is a compelling case that 
many of you might not uh, really know from looking at the numbers because they are so uh, conservative and understated. Yeah, the, the other point I would make about the CapEx is that absolutely, this is a large project and it really is a major company scale project. We, we make no bones about that. Um, but one thing that people should should uh, you know look into a little bit more to understand how to value these projects is uh, is the Canadian federal government passed new legislation earlier this year that includes a critical minerals um, extraction and processing tax credit. That's a thirty percent tax credit on capital expenditures to extract and to process critical minerals in Canada. So for every uh, million dollars of capital expenditure, the government will actually cover you know, uh, about uh, $300,000 of that. And so, yes, that gross uh, CapEx figure of $2.2 billion is absolutely the case. But then we believe in our interpretation of the of that legislation that the, the government of Canada will actually, you know, cover approximately 30% of that figure. And that's obviously not insignificant to the economic profile of the, uh, of the asset. That's huge. I mean, that's basically 660 million US that we're talking about that uh, Canada foots the bill for, uh, obviously shows you how critical these minerals are, that they put that much out. And, and the, you know, you can't even put that in your PFS, I guess, because you're not supposed to uh, put in uh, tax credits and things like that when you compile the number. But then the number has become almost unbelievable, Martin. Yeah. So to clarify, the, the 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 economic model in the PFS does incorporate our assumptions around how that tax credit will be applied. Um, but to your point, it just underscores the kind of the importance of these projects and the importance that the the government of Canada uh, is placing on the advancement of these projects. Absolutely. All right. So moving on to switching up gears, moving on to other matters. Uh, Panasonic battery, uh, to- Toyota battery, I should say. Uh, the deal came forward with them. Yeah, so um, uh, uh, Toyota and Panasonic formed a joint venture company uh, a couple of years ago called Prime Planet Energy and Solutions, or PPES. It's a bit of a mouthful, but basically it's Toyota's majority-owned electric vehicle battery company, the, the, the company that they have formed to make batteries for their vehicles with Panasonic, which is the leading uh, battery maker in Japan currently. Um, and so... This group is 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 currently constructing its first EV battery plant in North Carolina, uh, and I believe it's going to come online sometime in 2025 or 2026. And thereafter, they'll they're also thinking about construction of a second battery plant elsewhere in North America. So with that comes a real need for PPES or this Toyota battery company to secure uh, its supply chains of raw materials of critical minerals that go into making the batteries. So lithium, cobalt, graphite, and of course, nickel figures prominently in that. Um, uh, In the last couple of years, PBS has done two uh, memorandums of uh, memoranda of understanding with mining companies around nickel. Uh, The first was with BHP uh, and the second was with uh, us, FPX, earlier uh, here this year. It was announced in September. So that that announcement came at a signing ceremony that we had with representatives of PPES in Ottawa, which is the nation's capital of Canada. Earlier this year, it was attended by several prominent ministers at the federal level, both from Canada and from Japan. Their 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 minister, economy, trade, and and uh, and investment was there, and so it was a great event to kind of formalize our relationship with PPES. And you know, happy to talk more about what that agreement means and what it, what it could lend lend itself to here down the road. So obviously, Toyota Motor Company, largest vehicle producer in the world, uh, currently expanding their EV endeavors. So potential future demand. There was just an article the other day that they've uh, supposedly perfected a uh, solid state battery, Toyota, which means if they really have and if it's uh, commercially feasible. Uh, they're going to have a near insatiable appetite for the metals going into batteries. Yeah, whether in the form of the solid state uh, or 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 in the more conventional lithium ion battery uh, formulations, uh, absolutely. They they've said that nickel is is sort of a high priority for them. You know, the agreement that we have with them really establishes a framework for a vertical integration of a of a nickel supply chain to to uh, serve in part 
their nickel requirements for their supply chain. So um, the third member, the third party to that MOU is JOGMEC. JOGMEC is the Japanese uh, state agency for mineral exploration. Um, and it's a group that we already have a pre prior uh, joint venture in place with um for exploration for the for the particular type of nickel deposits that we're after jogmec is playing a critical role as a, as a representative of the japanese government in unlocking funding opportunities for japanese industry to invest in critical minerals projects to secure offtake and and other forms of rights to future nickel production and so there there's going to be an ability here for us to continue to discuss this, the strategic opportunities around vertical integration with JogMEC and with the Toyota Battery Company, um, and to see what what the opportunities there are for, for for that collaboration to to come fruition to fruition in the form of upstream investment by the Japanese government and by PPES to continue to allow us to advance uh, the Baptiste project at at, at at a rapid pace. We're talking about Baptiste. We're not even like thinking about Van, which is probably bigger than Baptiste. I just wanted to add that, but all the attention right now by you of necessity and the market, uh, maybe by nearsightedness is on Baptiste. We've kind of, you know, we've kind of forgotten all about Van, uh, you know, just as an aside, what's happening with Van right now? Yeah. So Van, you know, as you mentioned, is a discovery that we made, uh, first from surface sampling and then confirmed in two very strong seasons of drilling in 2021 and 2022. We do have the makings of a, of a, of a discovery there, a mineral deposit that could indeed rival or potentially exceed Baptiste in its scale and in its grade. Uh, we did not drill at, at Van next year, but it's certainly something that we would look to do uh, as a potential in future years to continue to expand that resource and to really demonstrate that you know beyond the, the 29 year my life of Baptiste, there is scope for continued expansion of of the what we call the Dakar nickel district for for potentially multi decade or even multi generational nickel production. Yeah, sorry, just wanted to get that in because you know like everything has been about Baptiste recently, and I think that's important for the future upside of uh, FPX because whatever happens with Baptiste, in all likelihood, you're going to be still have Van to go. So. Just wanted to point that out. So finally, uh, relations with First Nations company, uh, with First Nations tribes, if you will, uh, stock price taking a bit of hit, a hit on that front. Can you just uh, give us a brief update where we're at there? Yeah. So in, in the big picture, the mineral claims that take far uh, occur in an area that uh, that coincides with the traditional territories of four. Uh, First Nations for separate First Nations here in North Central British Columbia. Um, and those those nations that are centrally impacted are Klaasda Nation and Vinche Wu Ten. Uh, um, you know, Klaasda Nation has come out with some public comments stating their concerns about mineral exploration and, and mine development in their territory. We absolutely uh, hear those concerns and we take them very seriously. Uh, we have had a, a relationship with uh, with Clausen for the last 14 years. Uh, we, we've engaged in close collaboration with the elected representatives and the and the uh, and the constituent clan heads uh, or, or KO holders within the nation, uh, going back for several years. And we we also engage in similar discussions with some of those with those neighboring nations that I mentioned, most particularly Benche Wu Tan. Um, you know, we do have an agreement in place. We have had an agreement in place with Boston Nation. There are certain confidentiality provisions around that that prevent us from, from discussing in great detail uh, exactly what's in that agreement. But what, what I'd say is that we continue to expect that we'll be entering the environmental assessment process in 2024. And we expect that process to really fully articulate the impacts of, of the Baptiste project, um, the, the environmental mitigations that can be put in place and really looking at some of the enhancements that we can uh, work together with these nations to make to the land base and to the land use to really work towards preserving those key areas of cultural and environmental se sensitivity and those key habitats that are so important to these communities. And we fully acknowledge that that's a fundamental part of how we want to develop this project. And we look forward to continued opportunities to engage with Klaus and Nation with Bitche. Uh, Wu Ten and the other uh, uh, impacted nations to continue to move this project forward 
as well as close collaboration with both the federal government of Canada and the provincial government of BC to support all of those discussions going forward. All right. Well, I, we're always optimistic and I'm sure the uh, issues will be resolved favorably to everybody's benefit because uh, projects like this don't come along every day. And uh, the, uh, the fact that it is a critical uh, mineral, hopefully uh, that will, uh, that will play a, a role in the, uh, in the discussions. Yeah, for sure. It, 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 it is a time where we, we have to recognize as a society that we're all using these critical minerals. Uh, a lot of that supply of nickel is currently coming from places like China and Russia. China and Russia controls something like 70% of the global nickel uh, supply side. And so diversifying away from those sources of nickel is, is critically important. And uh, But at the same time, these are projects in Canada that I think can, can be developed in a way that really advance the, the, the theme of reconciliation with these First Nations uh, groups. And, and that's, that's a high priority and it it's, sits at the, at the core of what our values are as a company and being able to do. Yeah. And in the end, it's all about values. Hey, Martin, appreciate your coming on, giving us this update. We've been anxiously looking forward to it. Uh, check out fpxnickel.com, company's official website. Sign up for notifications so you can be up to date on the latest developments. The ticker symbols US FPOCF. And of course, in Canada, it's FPX. Uh, Martin, hey, we'll look forward to getting an update from you in the future, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks again, Kerry. Really appreciate it. The Financial Survival Network.